revolution. I mean, revolution in the butt and the, but the core of the earth. And it's uh, very appropriate to have this as part of the first Eastern Illinois University uh, uh, in Charleston, Illinois, the first symposium in technology and science. And uh, we chose the theme uh, for that symposium to be revolutions in science and technology paradigms. What a coincidence to have the same tectonic thing. We don't want anything to happen today like that uh, anywhere in the world, but uh, we'll uh, see what this paradigm shift um, leads to. Uh, Dr. Stephen Daniels, the uh, chair of the physics, is uh, working with me in this, uh, putting this together. He couldn't be here today, but uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker, Dr. Katie Lundowski. You say it. Lundowski. Lundowski, right? Did I say it right? Yeah. Okay, please join me with in welcoming our speaker. I'm going to talk a little bit about clay tectonics, which is, um, it explains <coughs> so many things in the earth sciences. Um, and so it's a, it's a concept that we teach in all of our intro classes, um, and it has a very interesting story as to how it came to be discovered and, and accepted. Um, in preparing for this talk, I, I was reading Naomi Resky's um, book of essays uh, called Clay Tectonics, an Insider's History of the Modern Theory of the Earth. It's really interesting. She, she is a historian of science, a historian of geology, and um, it has a bunch of essays written by people who were there at the time, and it's their memories of, of how things um, happened. And one of the things she says, a quote that I thought um, really captured uh, how this revolution happened is that research thrives where smart people can work together and share data and ideas. And it really was a gigantic project. Um, it was many people were working on, on trying to understand uh, the Earth's processes um, and their expression. Uh, and and I, don't, I don't know that it would have come to light if there weren't so many people working on it. So at first I thought that I would tell you what plate tectonics is, because many of you are chemists, and so I don't know if you know much about plate tectonics. It's a, um, it's a global and unifying theory within our discipline. I am a micropaleontologist, and I refer to plate tectonics all the time, even though most of the evidence comes from um, geophysicists and petrologists, um, people that study the interior of the Earth, really. And basically it says that there are rigid lithospheric plates, which is the top, the sort of the, the crust, um, and those rigid lithospheric plates move over uh, a plastic asthenosphere, which is the, the um, essentially the mantle. Um, and it, it has kind of a consistency of silly putty. And so it, it flows, but it can also break. Um, and the thing that drives the movement of the plates, and we know, um, you know, you probably all know that the Earth has not always had the same configuration, um, that there were times in the past where there have been supercontinents, and there have been multiple times in the past where there were supercontinents. Um, and it's really the mantle convection, so it's like if you think about a boiling pot of, of water, um, you heat it up and then you have convection cells within your boiling pot of water. The water on the bottom heats up, and as it, as it becomes less dense, it moves up to the top, and you have these cells. And it's the same idea in, in the mantle, only you have, um, you know, the, the fluid is actually different. And, and like I said, it's a theory that's used by all our scientists. So like I said, I study tiny little critters that live on the seafloor, and I use plate tectonics all the time to explain some of the things that I see. Um, I want to talk both about um, how it was discovered and some of the interesting human stories uh, associated with it. Um, it was essentially developed over the course of the 20th century. Um, it started out really with um, Alfred Wegener's uh, theory of continental drift, which was rejected by, especially by North American scientists. Um, and then uh, eventually it was accepted in as the theory of plate tectonics after much more evidence was collected, much more data looked at um, in, the, in the mid to late 60s. There were many, like I said, there were many, many scientists that were involved um, in the project. Although there were a few, um, few 
few women and no African Americans really um, involved in it because of because of the times and because many of these scientists had sort of personal connections um, to each other. Um, and there were a few institutions. So while there were many scientists, most of them were from four institutions. They were from Cambridge in Britain, um, from Columbia University's Lamont Geological Observatory. It's now it's it's now now known as the Lamont Doherty Geological um, Observatory. Uh, the University of California Scripps Institute of Oceanography and Princeton University. And so I'm going to highlight some of the scientists that worked on this. I can't talk about all of them because there are too many. Like I said, it's a story of data sharing. And so all of these people were working to try to figure out what was going on in the, in the oceans, what made ocean basins, um, what, what was that, you know, what were mid-ocean ridges and why are they there? Uh, what are trenches, uh, and so because they were sharing their data, there was a rapid development of ideas because the more you talk to people and talk about their ideas, um, a lot of times the, the more rapid the development of ideas. And it's, it's really a story of an effective interpretation of data. One of the reasons that this theory was developed was because there was a lot of federal funding of science at the time. Um, there was funding to begin with, um, you know, in the, in the early part of the 20th century, there was funding to discover, to really to understand how sound waves worked in the ocean because they wanted to dis be able um, to detect submarines um, and to be able to exploit that. So it was a military project. Um, there, was, uh, there were uh, other reasons as well, and so there was lots of funding of earth science. Of course, when World War II started, there was even more um, impetus to, to, to find German U-boats and things like that, um, and to be able to hide within shadow zones. Um, and, so, and so that's one reason there was a, a lot of funding. Um, also, because of the GI Bill, right after the war, there were a lot more people going to college, and there were a lot more people uh, you know, pursuing higher education. And, and so that's probably another contributor to this. And, you know, of course, military funding of scientific research for national security is gonna involve large labs and team-oriented approaches. And so that's one thing that supported this. You know, there were a few institutions with many people because there were senior scientists working on it and then there were grad students working on it as well, as many of you are probably aware. <laughs> Um, the Office of Naval Research funded a lot of a lot of the studies, um, and they funded studies at the uh, Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution as well as at Scripps in California and Lamont in New York. And really, the the idea was to understand the physical oceanography, to look at underwater sound, to do echo sounding and things like that, to be able to image the sea floor, what did it look like? I mean, to us it just looks like, you know, you would imagine that, oh, it's just you can see the water, but you don't know what it looks like down there, but there are hills and valleys and, and things down there. Um, and they wanted to be able to um, use sound, use the echo sounding and things like that to be able to image it. As well as looking at magnetics, um, people discovered that there are these weird patterns on the ocean floor where you have um, magnetic alignment of basalts and even of sediments um, that contain magnetic minerals, um, and they switch. You have kind of a zebra pattern that occurs. Um, it's, you know, they show it in textbooks and it looks black and white, and black and white, and it's symmetrical <coughs> along the mid-ocean ridge. Um, and so they wanted to understand why, what caused that, and, and you know, what does that tell us? As well as bathymetry, and bathymetry um, is really understanding what the, what the heights and depths of the ocean look like. Like I said, it is a, a unified global theory um, and it is data driven. Um, the data and the data was collected as a result of oceanographic expeditions. Oceanographic expeditions are very, very expensive. It's very expensive to operate a boat, or operate a ship. You have to have a crew, you have to have scientists on board. Um, you often have all kinds of gadgets um, and doohickeys that you're going to try to collect data with. Um, and, and so it's, it, it's logistically very complicated to run these kinds of expeditions. Um, people usually work basically around the clock. They work, the scientists will work on 12-hour shifts. 
um, because you know they have to collect as much as they can um, and and use use the money wisely. Basically, um, we'll talk a little bit about continental drift um, in a minute, but uh, the years from 1945 to 1970 were really the time when uh, evidence was being gathered to support um, plate tectonics. Um, as, as I said before, the, the bathymetric data and understanding what the seafloor looked like, how diverse uh, things were on the seafloor, and then um, as well as understanding everything about the oceans. They didn't really know that much about the oceans. Uh, people had been crossing the oceans for thousands of years, but to really understand what are, you know, what's going on with uh, chemical and physical properties, um, what are air-sea interactions, and like I said, what's, what's going on magnetically and as far as gravity uh, has to go, has, has to do with the, the seafloor. Um, I wanted to go back a little ways and talk about some of the evidence that comes from a long time ago. Um, even as far back, as far as that goes, um, Leonardo da Vinci in the 15th century had noticed that, you know, there are fossils up on land and how, how did they get there? And so um, there were people who had realized that probably things weren't exactly as they are today. Um, in the 16th century, uh, there were scientists that had noticed that if you, if you look at maps and you compare the, the fit of continental edges, they, you can, you can uh, fit it together like a jigsaw puzzle. Um, and then in the 19th century, when paleontology really took off, um, field geologists had noticed that there were many fossils in different places that matched up that, does, it, that are nowhere near each other. And we'll talk about some of that data when we talk about um, continental drift. And then in the early 20th century, um, Seuss, who, who was, I believe he was an Austrian, um, and he came up with this, this Gondwana land theory, which is, it, it's kind of the first theory of supercontinents. Um, and that is important. The supercontinent idea is important to, particularly to Wegener's uh, continental drift theory. So Wegener, um, and Wegener was an outsider. He was not a geologist. He was a meteorologist, and this was one of his problems. This is one reason that people, the, the North American geological community, did not want him to be part of this, um, he, and because he was a meteorologist. And so he came at this problem from a paleoclimate point of view. He was looking at, there are these deposits, there are, there are glacial deposits that um, are on far flung across different continents in the southern hemisphere. And so how did they get there? They are in places where today you wouldn't expect to have glaciers. Um, and so he came up with, I think he published in 1915, he published his theory of continental drift. Um, and basically, uh, a, a major keystone of this was, was Pangaea, and Pangaea was a supercontinent to, that was um, basically together about 250 million years ago. As you can see, most of the continents are are stuck together and you have the, the, this gigantic, there's the Tethy Sea up there, um, and then the gigantic ocean, which is the Panthalassa Ocean. Um, and some of his evidence for this, of course, we go back to the idea of the jigsaw puzzle fit of the continents, which some of you probably did a lab in fifth grade where you had to fit them together. <laughs> um, he also looked at mountain belts, and you could tell that there are mountain belts. Um, you know, the Appalachians actually match up with mountain belts in, in Scandinavia and in the British Isles. Um, and they are the same age. You can find the same kind of fossils and things like that. Um, and so we know that today, we know that those were together. And he said, well, maybe, maybe those were actually part of a continuous mountain chain in the past. We can look at fossils of organisms that were living um, that, and, and their life habits were such that they would not be able to cross an ocean. So this, um, this Mesosaurus, which is a crocodile-like reptile, it likes to live in aquatic environments, but there's no way it would be able to swim all the way across the ocean. Um, and they, these fossils are found in both Africa and in South America. So how do, do we have evolution of two, two of the exact same organisms on different continents, which seems seems like that wouldn't happen. Or is it that these two land masses were close together when, when, these, uh, when these critters were alive? 
which seems more likely. And then the, the glacial deposits. And so you can see um, today, we look at these glacial deposits, we can see um, glacial deposits from 300 million years ago on Antarctica, um, Australia, Madagascar, India, Africa, and South America. And these places are all, um, they're not very close together, and it seems very weird that you would have them in India. Um, but if we look at, if we put fit all those continents together and we look at where they were 300 million years ago, we can see that it makes sense because there was a big ice sheet sitting on the pole at the time. Unfortunately, North American scientists hated it. They thought it was bad science. They rejected it outright. Um, they, there were some, uh, there are some reasons for this. One is that um, American science uh, believed that there should be multiple working hypotheses, sort of an idea that, that, that it was a democracy of ideas. You didn't want any one theory to, to be, and this is Naomi Rusky's uh, interpretation of it, but it seems like it, it fits. Um, and so you didn't want any one theory to be uh, supreme over any of the others. Um, good science was supposed to be empirical, inductive, and modest. And the, the, theory of plate, uh, the theory of continental drift didn't fit into that. It was incompatible with the way that Americans thought about isostasy, which is basically the equilibrium um, between the, the, the lithosphere and the asthenosphere. And I'm not going to go into that for you guys. Um, and then. Uh, this idea of the legacy of uniformitarianism, which is the idea that the, the present is the key to the past. Well, it doesn't really fit, does it? Is it because we're saying the continents don't look like they, they do today, 300 million years ago. And so, so these were all reasons why North American scientists said, this is a terrible idea. We're going to reject this, plus the fact that he's an outsider in the community. And so, um, so it, it was kind of put to bed in uh, North America, but people continued to collect evidence. Um, one of them is looking at, at gravity, which is, which is the idea, uh, they did gravimetric readings over the oceans and things like that. There is a, a density contrast between rocks in the ocean, the basalts, um, and then rocks on land, which are, um, which are the crustal, uh, the crust part, the continental crust, is, is thicker, but it is less dense, and so it sits up. And so that's one reason you have the Himalayas. They're very, very thick, but they're, they're less dense, but they also have, um, they have this gigantic root that extends down into the mantle to, to uh, keep them there. Um, and so gravity was one way in which they looked at it, and there were um, technological advancements uh, you know, gadgets and things like that that were um, developed to look at gravity in the oceans. Um, and so, like I said, submarine warfare was a major part of this, World, World War II, uh, and so there was a lot of funding of American, uh, American science at the time in order to combat submarine warfare because there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of losses in the beginning of the war. They, they uh, put together a worldwide standard seismograph uh, network, which was a way to collect seismographic, and so looking at earthquakes um, and volcanoes and things like that, um, they could get an idea of what was going on in the oceans. Uh, and then, again, developments in geophysics and oceanography, so development of magnetometers, um, things like that, as well as imaging processes, um, and then interpreting the magnetics. Some of the major contributors uh, were Harry Hess, who was actually in the Navy, and one of his jobs while he was in the Navy was to echo sound the Pacific. Um, and he is credited with the, the theory of seafloor spreading, which is the idea that the mid-ocean ridge is where, um, where the seafloor is spreading and, and the ocean is getting larger. He uh, published this along with um, Robert Dietz, uh, and he was from Princeton University. Maurice Unit Ewing, who was uh, the director of Lamont in New York, and he collected enormous amounts of geophysical data um, that you know, were interpreted by, by many different scientists. Bruce Heason, who mapped the ocean ridges in the 1950s, he was a geologist, he was at Columbia, at, at Lamont, um, and then Marie Tharp, the only woman um, that we're gonna mention. And she, she just died recently, 
um, over the last five years or so. And um, she started out as Ewing's research assistant, but then she um, she spent most of her career working with Bruce, Bruce Heathen. And they, a lot of the data that was collected was actually classified. Um, and so one of the things that they did is they figured out a clever way to get around uh, publishing the data. They did an artistic impression. They, they made a map. And this is, this is hand drawn. Um, and this is, so they got away with doing this because it was an artistic impression, even though it is, it's accurate. This is actually in my oceanography textbook. I refer to this all the time. Um, you, can see, you can see the features in the ocean. You can see the oceanic plateaus. You can see the, the ridges. Um, you can see the transform boundaries and things like that. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, Vine and Matthews uh, did a lot of work on the magnetic, uh, the magnetic data that comes from uh, the seafloor, as well as Lawrence Morley. They, they sort of published at the same time, and so now it's referred to as the, the Morley, Vine, and Matthews um, theory. And then um, J. Tuzo Wilson, who was a Canadian, and he really discovered transform boundaries and, and began to, uh, you know, sort of publish on what transform faults were. And so the evidence, as I said, and I'll wrap it up, <laughs> um, is gravity data, the Earth's magnetic field, uh, paleomagnetism, seafloor mapping. They did a lot of earthquake studies and then heat flow because the heat flow is greater at the ridges where you're erupting new basalt, uh, whereas uh, it's, it's less in other places. Um, I'm just going to skip because uh, because of time. I'm not going to go into paleomagnetism, but just a little bit. Uh, paleomagnetism, we can look at rocks, and they have a magnetic signature, particularly um, basalts and some sediments that are that have um, little tiny pieces of magnetic minerals in them. And so, when basalts cool, they cool through a point known as the Curie point. And the minerals will align according to the magnetic field that existed at that time. Um, and it's going to look different at different latitudes. And so we can actually use that to reconstruct where those rocks were when they were erupted. Um, and so that's a really powerful tool for us. We can see that, oh, you know, those rocks were at the equator or they were up at the poles at the time. And so that can help us to reconstruct uh, the supercontinents or the, where the continents were in the past. Um, we can also look at a polar wander. Um, you can see from here, if we look at polar wander data, um, this, is, uh, this is from Europe and this is from North America and it doesn't match up, but if we actually move the continents to where they were 300 million years ago, they match up. And so again, just using the, the, the magnetic um, data. This is the, the stripes that I was referring to. And so they knew that there were stripes and it has the zebra pattern. So you've got white and then, and in this case, red. Um, and so it shows when the rocks are erupted at the center of the mid-ocean ridge, um, they are, oh, they align to the Earth's magnetic field. Um, and and you, get this, you get this pattern. So you have normal and reverse, normal, reverse, so on and so forth. Um, and that's just, um, more of the same, showing the basically the basin getting bigger. Earthquake studies, and that gives us an idea of where the plate boundaries are. Um, and over time, at divergent boundaries, you actually will, these are Wilson cycles, and so you actually end up with uh, an, an entire ocean basin. So today, we have rifting in East Africa. It, can, it could potentially, if it continues to rift, um, for a long time, it could potentially be like the Atlantic Ocean, eventually. <coughs> and then this is just just a picture to show the um, the, the mantle convection cycles. <coughs> and to end up, I'm a micropaleontologist, and I am I study little tiny critters that live on the seafloor, and I get my samples from a program that was started in the late '60s. And it was started right after plate tectonics, the theory of plate tectonics was published. Um, and basically the idea was to go out and collect more data um, on plate tectonics. It was started off as the, the deep sea drilling project and today it's actually the, they just changed their name this year, so it's now the Ocean, Integrated Ocean Discovery Pro Project. Um, and 
I did my dissertation samples from thing from uh, cores that were drilled from that, and uh, I continue to work with those types of samples. And so this is it's a unifying theory, and you know it's really changed the way that we look at earth science as a whole. Thank you. <laughs> well, any questions? I have twenty questions. Yes, yes please. Katie, I know it, it took a long time for this to become accepted. When would you say it became the consensus, uh, taught in classrooms and things of that nature? Uh, you know, I, Alan, do you, what do you think? I mean, it's probably, I don't know. I mean, by the time I got there, it was taught in classrooms, but what do you think? By the time I was working on PhD, it was in this classroom. Okay. In 65, so on. Okay. So it must be late 50s. Okay. That the consensus reached that the parts have been moving, all the evidence and earthquakes that went some around the plate, which was all the time, those earthquakes was compatible with the position of these plates because they move against each other, so the earth shakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? Let me ask a simple question. How truthful is the popular theory or popular thinking? or image of uh, the continents as like, mountains and filled with water in between. Uh, like any Hawaii, for example, it has a big mountain and it has... Well, Hawaii is a little bit of a different situation because it's, okay. it's, it's a hot spot. And so you have some sort of heat source underneath the mantle plume or something, um, which, which is heating it up and then you have, the plate is moving across it and that's why you get that little dot of islands. Yes. Um, so that's a little bit of a different, because that actually is, they are basaltic, which is the same material, sort of, as the, <laughs> as the ocean. So it as comes the ocean from floor. the bottom and the, yeah. uh, it's sort of the yeah. sides. And yeah. So, but, but the continents are not the same. The continents are, like have a, yeah, the continents have, the, the magma yeah. has evolved further, and so it is, it's, you know, we say that it's granite. It's yeah, not all, it's but it is in some places, and so, you know, the, the idea that you have plates where there's convergence and things like that, and then that you have uh, granites being erupted in some places, um, like the Sierra Nevadas and stuff like that, that 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 is true. Yeah, I know. It is accurate. And uh, let me ask about the earthquake things. That some places were known for a century, for many years, that uh, they are in the belt of earthquakes, mm -hmm. Japan and others. Right. But for our amendment, we had some happening, for example, in Egypt, uh, in uh, the nineties, where we have always thought that we are away from it, but it happened, and uh, I think it happened twice or three times in Japan. Is there any explanation why the belt is changing, or that's the way it is? Well, yeah, it's all it's always sort of changing. Is the thing that's that's it's slow, constant changes. That's what the plates move on a on a scale of centimeters per year. Um, and so over time, you know, over time rifts can fail and then they'll, you'll have rifting in other places. And just because of the, the dynamic nature of the convection cells and things like that, it is going to change. Because yeah. when we, we're growing as children, we hear about the Algerian or Moroccan uh, earthquake that happened in the 60s, I think, in Argentina or something. And then you have Turkey. Mm -hmm. And we have always, we grow up, let's like, say, we are safe because it happens up north yeah. and west, but it hit. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. So, what is the single most technological advance which, like, uh, geologists cherish now? You know, like, I mean, those days people were limited technology to explore. It kind of so, depends on what discipline you're looking at because, you know, uh, a lot of, a lot of the data today that's collected in geology is probably has to do with um, isotopes, um, and so so it's you know mass spectrometer work um, because people are people want to know things about oxygen isotopes or they want to date things and get you know potassium argon, and that's you know that's one of the potassium argon dating was one of the things that was developed during this time and it helped them to be able to understand the the ages of the basalts in the ocean basin. I didn't mean to bring chemistry, but chemistry came out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, if somebody asks you why is it that we have uh, geographic north and uh, magnetic north, why, why? Well, geographic, okay. So, geographic north, 
and maybe the geographer should answer this question. <laughs> the geographic north has to do with we just we just call a point at the at the north. We call it the north, you know, just yeah. the very top point. Whereas um, magnetic north actually does move. It's the real one. Yeah. This is where the island is England. Uh -huh. Always, yeah. always. Yeah. So why did they say okay since it points this? Well, why do we need a geograph? Why it's not always point north? I don't know, I'm not a geophysicist. Well, <laughs> it, it, that's the mathematical location. So it's, that's where you know lines of uh, lines of longitude converge. So that's the math. That's the math. It just happened to be there. Okay. Any other question? Very interesting uh, topic. And we really thank you very much for your